Thank you very much. So what we're going to do on this panel, so we have an hour, so we have a bit of time to get stuck into the issues. But bearing in mind the conversation, we wanted to have the deeper dive earlier on the notion of these bottom-up data trusts. So Gus is going to take us away with a few minutes on how he sees the nature of the problem that we're facing. Then I'll talk a little bit about the notion of data rights and whether a bill of data rights is helpful or not. And then we'll open up the conversation with Jenny, with Sana, then with Sylvie, and really start exploring some of those themes um, and then coming back as relevant to some of the sort of ideas and opportunities and risks that we saw in the concept of the bottom-up data trusts. So Gus. Good morning. Um, so I work at Privacy International, and we spend a lot of our time, too much of our time, um, taking cases against intelligence agencies because intelligence agencies understand what we understand, which is that data leads to intelligence. And I want to explore this idea a little bit more with some examples that will hopefully fuel some of the conversation we're going to have going forward. Um, there are arbitrary examples across time. So uh, using one example, in 2011, TomTom, Tom, the GPS company that gathered data of people's use of GPS in their cars, sold that, their data set to the Dutch police so that the Dutch police could set up um, speed, uh, speed cameras. They would use the, the GPS data to identify where cars were speeding, and then that anonymized data would help the police capture more uh, speeding cars. When it was discovered that this was happening, the TomTom Tom customers were outraged. But TomTom Tom said, don't worry, it's not your personal data, the police aren't gonna come after you. <laughs> But the customers, uh, customers said, yeah, but you're using that data against our interests. And eventually, TomTom Tom had to apologize and withdraw this entire scenario. Another example is in 2013, Facebook bought an Israeli uh, security company called Onavo. Um, and they also bought the capability of installing a VPN on your device. What Facebook then did is that whenever you use that VPN for free, Facebook was monitoring your general usage of the internet on your phone. So Facebook was able to identify very early on the competitive advantage that WhatsApp had. Using that data, Facebook was able to, well, I prioritized procuring WhatsApp and other types of services. So they used the data they got on broad usage for intelligence value to increase their market dominance. Just uh, three last examples. I don't know if you've ever heard the company um, called Unroll Me. But they, um, they run a service that helps you analyze your, uh, your emails to manage subscriptions and unsubscribes and so on and so forth. In 2017, they were caught selling intelligence based on this data on intelligence about your use of Lyft, and they were selling this data to Uber. So Uber was getting intelligence on your use of Lyft without you having any knowledge about it. And arguably, Unroll Me said, we're not sharing your personal data. Yeah, but they were sharing intelligence. Another example is if you have one of those uh, robot uh, vacuum cleaners. Um, iRobot, uh, in two years ago, was toying with the idea of selling um, to companies the layout of your homes. And they were saying, well, don't worry. It's not, we're not selling your personal data. It's just a layout of your homes. Fortunately, the New York Times covered this, and um, iRobot had to reverse policy. And, the last example I'm going to use is Strava. I don't know if you've heard of the of Strava, the running app. A couple of years ago, um, they published the data of the usage of the running app online and, and in map formats. And as a result of that, they were, um, people were able to identify military bases across the world because people on military bases often jog. And particularly high security military bases, you can't jog off the base, so you jog all around the base, and you essentially create a map of military bases. Now again, you could say, well, there's no personal data being disclosed, but the intelligence value is enormous. Mm -hmm. Now these are negative examples of data beyond your control, being used by others, and you're being told, don't worry, there's nothing going to happen to you, little people. It's all for intelligence value. But there's some positive examples for me to close off on. In 2017, Twitter barred intelligence agencies from getting access to their analytics to understand societies. That was, a, that was a brave step by Twitter at that time, and other companies haven't followed suit on that necessarily. Um, interestingly, the Chinese army in 2015 banned the use of wearables. Did they foresee a, a Strava-like moment arising so that if you're in the military, you can't wear a watch that will disclose your, your, your data for intelligence value? 
And one of my favorite examples is because my own organization did this. Back in um, December, we analyzed the top Facebook apps, I'm sorry, the top apps in the Google Play Store and analyzed the data coming out of them. And what we discovered was that Facebook, by default, was getting data on app usage, whether you were a Facebook user or not, whether you had Facebook installed on your phone or not. It didn't matter that um, Skyscanner, Kayak, Spotify was just sending your data to Facebook without even asking you. Fortunately, these companies, once we notified them of this fact, they've changed their practices. But what we found particularly interesting is that we analyzed the app that you have on your phone today for, the, for this conference, the CogX app, and just by opening the app, Facebook is getting your data. And it knows how long you're using the app for and when you close it. And it's beyond your control. And it's even, there's even a consent um, point on the app. But the data is leaving the app and going to Facebook even before you're able to en enter your consent. This is the way that data is being accumulated by these giant organizations. You have no knowledge, you have no control, but these aren't idiot organizations. They know what they're doing. They want this data because they see value, and that value is intelligence. I'll leave it there. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Gus. Um, so there's, there's three points I want to make jumping on from where Gus left it. The, the first one is... In, in looking and thinking about the Cambridge Analytica scandal, the Cambridge Analytica breach last year, I started thinking a lot about the impact of data on individuals and the impact of data on societies. And it struck me that one of the most surprising things about the Cambridge Analytica breach was the response. And a majority, I would say significant majority of the response in March and April 2018 was to say, Individuals should own their data. The Financial Times has an op-ed saying individuals should own their data and the problem will be solved. Now, aside from the debate around ownership or not, what struck me is that the sum totals of the individual privacies breached was completely different from the societal impact of the Cambridge Analytica scandal itself. And that got me thinking, and it's related, very related to Gus's point, that pretty much all of the regulatory solutions around data are focused on the individual. Very, very few are focused on groups. But the examples Gus is giving, the Strava example, is an example of a group. It's the group pattern that enables you to see whether this is a military base or not. Um, and then going forward, it struck me that people, us, were as much or at times more affected by data about other people than we are about data about us. And that's one of the sort of challenges I have. You talked about it in terms of shared provenance for the data trust model. But I think that this notion that, you know, for example, you have the delete my data button in Facebook and elsewhere, that it doesn't delete the ways in which my data was used for training purposes. The way that my data was used for training purposes on the impact of other people remains. And so in many ways, we're bound by other people's data and we're bound by other people's consent. And I think that fundamentally, this notion of other people's data impacting my life and our societies is hopefully one of the last nails in the coffin of notice and consent. Because you know, machine learning fueled group profiling really invalidates individual notice and consent. And I think, um, again, one back to one of Gus's points, the irony in this is that many technology companies base part of their profits from analyzing group behavior. You know, if we look at Shoshana Zuboff's from surveillance capitalism's analogy, the individual data is just the raw material. Group behavior analysis is one of the finished products. So one of the big questions I have for the whole group and for all of us, is how do we think about regulating that? The first point. Second point is that in thinking about this, so I wrote an article a few months ago, and I actually hadn't set out um, to, to write an article about drafting a bill of data rights, but the editor was pushing me, saying, well, you have to, you know, sort of like, what are we going to do about this? And I think we landed on, on the notion in talking a lot with Jenny and the folks at the Open Data Institute that I think the notion of data rights is a very powerful one that falls somewhere in between or beyond the notion of data protection 
and the notion of data privacy. Um, so in thinking about data rights, for some of those, and going back to Sylvia Neal's point, they're quite sort of, you know, fundamental human rights. They're quite absolutist. So the right of the people to be free from having their behavior surreptitiously manipulated, for example, or saying that there should be purpose limitations on products. So if you buy a Nesta thermostat, there should be a purpose limitation. It should gather data related to you and others for the purposes of heating your home, not for the purposes of feeding information to insurance companies. Or simply, you know, that there should be a prohibition on secondary data markets. That the secondary data market that sits between the Nest thermostat and the insurance companies and fuels that data, that, shouldn't, that just simply shouldn't be allowed. Now, I think that for me, and then it's a question I'll be, I am, and will be asking to, to our panel and all of you, is, is the notion of a hey, data rights, and then potentially a bill or not of data rights, is that a helpful notion? The world is kind of awash with principles, especially AI ethics. At one point, I counted nine concurrent principle setting exercises. So is it at all helpful? And it may very well not be. But if it is, what's the purpose? Is it to draw a clear line in the sand to say, you know, like purpose limitations? You develop a product, the product should be developed for that particular purpose. And if you're changing the purpose, there should be a process for that. Or is the notion to be able to have these conversations about, you know, what rights are relative or not to others, what rights may be mandated, may be assignable to others. So I think that's, that's something that I'm very keen in discussing, especially as the way I'm seeing part of the conversation going relates to Sylvia Neal's um, presentation, is this notion of looking at data rights a little bit the, like the way we look at the governance of the commons. So Sylvia, you were giving the example of a river. So in a river, I may have the right to irrigate my field based on the water from the river. I may probably do have the right to drink the water from the river if I'd like to, but I may not have the right to use it as a passing point to pass a boat down the river. And I think that my hunch is that the more that we go into this side of sort of talking about rights as a right stack, and saying, well, this right is relevant and this right is not. We're going into the domain of sort of more relative rights. And does that come as a detriment of a notion of rights which is more sort of absolute rights? You know, like we should be free from having our behavior surreptitiously manipulated, for example. So that's the second question. Um, I'm going to throw quite a few at you. I'd love to have a view from the panel on. And then just briefly to, to end. So again, I think for me at least, all of you may be sort of miles beyond my understanding on this, but the fact that our notion of data protection really focuses on the individual much more than it does on groups, and the fact that a lot of the harm that we in our societies are at risk of comes from groups was kind of a, a watershed moment. And I really want to thank Lynette Taylor at Tilburg University for walking me through some of this, through some of this thinking. Now, that, uh, Gus has given great examples. I'll just give an additional two as a contrast, and then to, as a springboard for the conversation. A lot of the conversations about group privacy rights, when you push the people who are experts in the field, to my understanding, you end with the question of, well, at the end of the day, you, we need to make a decision as societies as to what data-driven interventions are legitimate or not. So I'll give you two examples. Example one, a group of people is crossing North Africa. They're making their way across Libya, they're going up. They may be going in the direction of the Mediterranean coast. It looks like they're going in the direction of the Mediterranean coast. I've got access to satellite data. I'm tracking the group pattern, and I've got some anonymized access to mobile data. It may simply be the type of mobile data packages that they have. Based on that, I make a, a, a probabilistic assumption that that group of people are migrants who is seeking to gain asylum in the European Union. And on that basis, I preemptively do an intervention, so I preemptively potentially incarcerate them, for example. Example one. Example two, I'm running a chain of um, high-tech stores. And in that chain of high-tech stores, I've developed an algorithm that can track the patterns based, again, on anonymized mobile data patterns. I'm tracking the patterns of the people walking around the store. And based on that pattern, I'm analyzing which of the potential customers, or at least users in the store, may be more likely, or are more likely, I think, 
to steal an item and those that are less likely. And those that are more likely, I'll have a security guard be really close to them. And those that are less likely, they can roam about with the expensive products. Is one of them bad? Is one of them good? Are they the same? How do we think about the legitimacy of these data-driven interventions? And again, it strikes me that, um, at least I think that's a very important question when we come to the crux and pushing at this notion of group rights, and this goes to the notion of collective action that Sylvia and Neil are talking about, and to, to address sort of some of the threats that Gus has highlighted. So to kick us off, either Jenny or Sana, who would like to, who would like to start? I'm going to put you on the spot because we haven't heard from you yet. So. Uh, why don't I just introduce myself and then Please. maybe Jenny can Wonderful. make the, the intelligent comments. Um, so I'm Sana Kergani. I head up the, the UK government's office for AI. Um, this, these topics are, are ones that are very important to us in government. Um, I should start by saying nothing I'm saying is actual government policy. It'll be um, you know, my opinions on the panel. Um, um, plus uh, uh, shining a light on some of the things that we are doing in government. So um, there are two, uh, there, there is one institution that we've created called the Center for Data Ethics and Innovation. Um, they are looking at some of these issues. They are uh, delving into some of the questions that we're asking today. Um, they're, they're looking at uh, kind of the gaps that exist in um, our knowledge around data-driven and AI technologies. Um, and, and the ethical uh, questions that these bring up. They have done an uh, external consultation and at the moment they're, they're looking at micro-targeting um, and bias. And they're looking at this across a number of different sectors, for example, finance, insurance, and others. Um, and so some of the, the questions that you brought up, Martin, I think um, have parallels to that. So, uh, you know, for example, looking at patterns of behavior and then potentially putting in protection against that for me has parallels to, to things we do today you know um, but at a much smaller scale and I think that the the question here that we are faced with is one that um, I think uh, from my perspective I think we should remember kind of just our own rules and laws and and um, and, and just human rights right and um, and the the big question now is that we're able to do and predict uh, things on a much broader, more massive scale that affects a lot more people. And so potentially we are now you know, amplifying our own personal biases in a way that we wouldn't have previously been able to because of access to these kinds of data, which is why we have to answer some of these questions that we're, we're facing. The other group um, that we have uh, in government is called the National Data Strategy. Um, and today we're announcing so I'm going to steal the thunder a little bit of the Secretary of State, who will be announcing um, a little bit later an open consultation for the national data strategy uh, to everyone. So an open consultation to understand the data landscape that exists. So there is a lot of work that is being done by a lot of different groups of people, um, a lot of intellectuals, um, academics, organizations, and others around these questions. And the na national data strategy is trying to uh, have a look at that and kind of map out that, that bit of work, which I think is a very important piece of work for government to take on um, being in a in slightly unique position where we can, we can have an open consultation like that and gather that information uh, from others to be able to paint that landscape. I think that is also another quite important role that we can play from a government perspective to to helpfully um, show areas that we should, as a, as a group, as a whole country, potentially concentrate on or, or, or spend more time thinking about. C can I continue putting you in the hot spot there? <laughs> so this, this question of, am I right to ask the question of legitimacy of data-driven intervention? Do you think this is a relevant question from, from where you sit? It's just, it, I'm struck by how this, this sort of analysis of the patterns of groups, it strikes me, we'll see what others think, as the correct analysis of the problem. The solution there, I'm always a little bit sort of lacking. Like, is this, is this helpful? Like, is it basically societies and others need to decide? Like, you know, it's okay to track people in a store. It's not okay to incarcerate people on the basis that they may be migrants. It's probably not okay to incarcerate migrants in the first place. I mean, is that a helpful way for our field to go? Is that unhelpful? What do you think? So, 
I would say, I, I think it's important to think about these questions. Um, but I also think that there, that it may be important for us to concentrate a slightly more broadly on consumer rights rather than specifically on, um, you know, collective data rights or, you know, it, 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 what we've been speaking about. Just because I worry a little bit that, you know, technology and, and will move on and we need to try and stay slightly broader. So not to say that we would abstract away from it completely. I think these are important questions that we have created organizations to help us answer it. And, and um, I, do, I do think that this idea of, you know, individuals' rights versus a group is a, is a really interesting topic and that I would like to hear more about. Um, and, and government as a whole would like to hear more about. But um, I do wonder whether we should be thinking more broadly around consumer rights more generally. That's very helpful. We'll come back to that. Thank you, Zona. All right, hot, hot seat for Jenny. So there's a lot of things I would like to have your views on here. But let's we start around this question of sort of data-driven interventions and what some of the solutions are there. Is that a good direction to go in? Okay, um, so you know I can rant about a lot of this <laughs> for, for days. Um, I might so throw some other questions your way okay. to spice it up. So, so I'm Jenny Tenson, I'm CEO at the Open Data Institute, which is a not-for-profit that focuses on, on um, building an open and trustworthy data ecosystem. Um, and uh, I, oh God, there's, there's so much to <laughs> kind of um, uh, unpick around this. Um, I think that what we're what we're trying what we're all trying to aim for is to get the best value that we can out of data, while making sure that we trust that 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 uh, we're not getting harmed by the the way in which data is used. So we have this we have this dual thing that we're trying to aim towards, which is getting value, getting um, uh, getting the good things that can happen from the analysis of data. You always focus on the on the really bad ones, but the good things that can happen from the analysis of data to help our health, help our environment, and so on, um, while making sure that that's not harming um, us as individuals, as groups, and as societies. Um, that's the bit that we're really really struggling with, um, and what I, I completely agree with the with the uh, observation that we've gone beyond re thinking. We need to go beyond thinking that individual choices are going to necessarily lead us to the great value that we can get or the avoidance of harms because individual choices are narrow they do not see the emergent properties of the use of of data um, that means that we have to have some fundamental kind of understanding about what is uh, um, uh, what is allowed and what isn't allowed and that or another way of putting that is that we need to have a uh, an understanding of legitimacy which which goes beyond the just does one person say that this is okay or, or not okay how we get there isn't a this is one solution um, it's a Here's a whole mix of things that together provide us with the ecosystem and the the um, that, that enables us to do this. Um, for me, then, then the emergence of things like data trust, data clubs, data collaboratives, data cooperatives, those kinds of inst new institutions, those kinds of new third-party organisations that can provide a um, a, a pivot point for. Um, uh, making the very complex judgments which require huge amounts of consultation about the use of data, those are going to be really crucial in the future. How they're set up to confer legitimacy on them such that we've got trustworthy trustees, such that we've got great um, uh, uh, accountability around them so that they can so that we are assured that they are acting for the purpose that they are set up to those are the things that I think are interesting and challenging that we need to that we need to dig into I can I can go on but you maybe want to come in let's come back in a second because I, I want us to also get deeper onto the data trust piece C can but I just say something about because your, your yes, question the initial question was about you said oh is data I mean are data rights fundamental rights or are they effectively ways of trading assets, right? And I think this is a fascinating question, actually. I just want to say one minute about yes, this. Please. Because um, if you think about it, there's, there's a deep tension about the, what motivates us when we create 
an increasing number of regulatory tools to govern data. There are two, not necessarily competing, but two very different concerns at stake. On one hand is the fact that, yes, the fact that we leak data makes us vulnerable to an extent that we can say our concerns like human dignity are at stake, mm -hmm. yes? And that is the reason why when people got together to draft, say, the GDPR, there was a, a very strong move to think of the effort as driven by a human rights perspective rather than, say, a property rights perspective. Okay, that's very important. But at the same time, there's no denying that data is an asset. It's an asset that's being used for all sorts of commercially driven enterprises, initiatives. So how do you reconcile? And we have to think of those two aspects together. You cannot put your head in a, in a box and say, oh, no, no, but I'm worried about human rights perspective, and then ignore the fact that data is an asset, and that as such, actually, when you look at the GDPR, the portability, access, and erasure rights are actually, I think, rights that can be thought of as effectively types of property rights in the sense that they allow for moving data and ex uh, sharing data in different ways. Now, what's really interesting here, and we haven't had this in the past, is that data is actually uh, um, forces us to think about one kind of thing, data, with two different lenses, human rights and property rights together. And I, I, I think this leads to fascinating questions, and I, I hope that, for instance, the data trust proposal, and it's not the only proposal out there, I hope, is, is one way of acknowledging, on one hand, the fact that there is no question we need very robust top-down regulation to address the human rights issues. And when it comes to, for instance, the impact of, uh, say, say I'm your sister and I put all my life online, this will impact you, yes? And so for that, we need top-down regulation that will address those issues. But at the same time, we also need to, I think, empower private individuals to take control of their data to the extent that it is also an asset that's being used by corporations, yes? And so that's the, the tension, and it's a tension that's not easily resolvable, but I hope that a data trust proposal can be a complement to top-down regulation. And the top-down regulation being there to address human rights concerns, um, and the data trust proposal being a way of articulating different ways of prioritizing the balance between say, a, a concern for extreme privacy, or a concern for, some people may say, well, we want to make money out of our data. Yeah, so. so. So, that I want to come to. Let's hold, yeah. let's hold that one, because that's a good one. Um, it's partly a good one, because we have these very good, diplomatic, polite panels, everyone agrees, and then when you leave, it's like, oh, I completely disagreed with that. So, <laughs> without artificially creating some disagreement, I, I do want to understand where it may exist or not. So, Sylvie, you think that, yes, there are certain absolute fundamental rights, human rights, including data rights within that, um, and certain rights are also relative to one another, and there should be a process for assignability, mandate. You used to talk about assignability, so I'm once behind that, but mandatability of those rights, right? Yeah. So that should be possible. Gus, do you agree? <laughs> So I exist within the world of, um, I don't know if you've noticed this about the world, but the rule of law isn't exactly in very good health. Um, and the concept of a human right doesn't just exist because we wrote it down on a piece of paper in the 1940s and 1950s. It constantly has to be enforced. I've been in this field for 23 years, and I've been hearing a lot of this same language for 23 years. That is, oh, we're going to get this right, we're going to get this right, it's a human right, we're going to get this right, but nobody's actually enforcing it. 23 years later, we're analyzing apps that we think we're in control of, and the data is being fed out to Facebook and others without our control. How are we going to ameliorate that situation? And just to stoke the fires a little bit more, how are we going to create a national data strategy that's going to stop the generation of intelligence by data that's collected by intelligence agencies where we can't even get access to the law that governs them? 
That is the lived reality of this entire situation. And going back to uh, Martin's example of, uh, I think it was Libya you were mentioning, yeah. I'm not entirely sure what rule of law we're applying to a situation like this. And when, if their satellites are being used, what, what establishes jurisdiction of those satellites? And tell me, how many intelligence agencies across the planet are trying to monitor what's going on in Libya right now? How are we going to govern that? And by the way, they all have Facebook on their phones. So we have to govern Facebook at the same time. How are we going to do that? And please don't tell me we're going to use the exact same language we've been talking about for the entire time I've been in this field, or people have been in the human rights field since the 40s and 50s saying, oh, but fundamental rights are very important. We're going to find a way through this. When the power is stacked against them. Sorry. <laughs> I'm much more optimistic <laughs> than I sound, <laughs> but it's just. <laughs> so I am with you absolutely on the on the threat analysis okay what do you think we should do now based on your 23 years of experience a few years ago you and i would talk about this and you would say i haven't given up on data collection we yeah, need to continue exactly. focusing on restricting certain types of data collection it strikes me that in some areas that's feasible. In some areas, it's not. What, what's your sense? That's, I, I still do go back to that. And I use the example of the Chinese army. They said, no, you can't have wearables if you're in the army, because we can't trust that data from bleeding out to various collectors. That makes good sense. If we start with the original premise that people are vulnerable, and all of a sudden, we have these devices that nobody really understands who's in control of them any moment in time, constantly bleeding data out. Well, maybe we should go back to the source of the problem and say, actually, maybe we shouldn't have these devices unless we can be certain that they're not leaking data. So stop the generation of data to begin with. If you're going to generate data, understand where it's actually going. And then if it's going to places, understand how it's being used. And this is the whole Huawei story right now. This has become a level, a, a, an issue of Trumpian levels of like, okay, what happens when you invite in a company that you're not entirely sure how they run their systems, but they're now running the national infrastructure of 5G for the UK or for Germany or for other countries. And it's nice that we're finally asking these questions about where, what data is being generated. Maybe that data shouldn't be generated. Is it going back to China? Oh, geez, I don't know. Meanwhile, all these devices have that technology already in there, but we never asked it about this. We had to wait for President Trump to raise these types of questions. But we're asking them, and we, we're, we're realistically trying to come up with solutions to these problems. Okay, last one, and then I'll go back to, to Sun and Jenny. The example you give about the wearables and the Chinese military, that's effectively saying, I won't use the product. What about purpose limitations? What about saying yeah. that you know, a certain type of product should only use data in a certain type of way, which is aligned with what the product is built to do? Absolutely. But don't we then run into the wall? Like, how do you guard that? Do you not then end back into a consent regime saying, like, the data will be used for the purposes of which I've consented, and we know that doesn't work? So is purpose limitation, is that helpful? And if it is, how? Purpose, it's not. This is all purpose limitation as enshrined in data protection acts going back to the 1960s um, is exactly the right way forward, but it has to be enforced. How are you going to enforce it? Is it going to be automatically enforced by corporate lawyers? Is it going to be enforced by those great lawyers at GCHQ who promise us they're doing their jobs very carefully? Or is it going to be through public action? Is it going to be through NGOs like mine taking action against Facebook or intelligence agencies? And you know what? That's exhausting. And it's not only exhausting, it's expensive. And this is not a fundraising pitch. But it takes a lot of time and energy to hold the few accountable when this is a pervasive problem. And just, like, just to add a little bit of color to the GDPR, when GDPR was being negotiated, we were there, there were 4,000 amendments introduced by industry. The fact that we got GDPR out is extraordinary, considering it was the most attempted amended piece of legislation in the history of the, of the European Union. These are the stakes. This is the level of resistance. But purpose limitation is terrifying to industry and to government, because they can't pivot. They can't do that additional processing to derive that intelligence from which they derive their power. And that's exciting.
Jenny. So I think you listed there a, a, a whole bunch of different kinds of organizations and approaches to building both accountability and legitimacy around the, the use of data. You, you listed um, regulation and enforcement of regulation. There is a strong role to be played there. You listed um, the role of civil society groups, and I think that we have to, and, and you know, this, this would be one of the things that, that I would uh, say for the national data strategy and for the, and for the other kinds of um, initiatives that government is putting in place, actually making uh, data available about the use of data Mm -hmm. um, is one way of helping to direct the attention of those third party, those third, those, those third sector organisations and the media organisations that need to apply pressure in a different way to the, to the use of data. I think we also need to pay attention to the role of, of auditors and formal auditing of organisations that are, that are dealing with data and, and wrap in... Um, uh, data due diligence to the normal financial due diligence that is, goes on. And the other thing that I think that we ought to be paying attention to is professionalization of particular kinds of roles. And we, Sylvia and Neil talk about trustees as being extremely important in a, in a data trust environment, as being a, a, a trusted individual or set of individuals. Um, they need to be barred from being trustees if they don't do their jobs correctly. There needs to be a consequence to those things. We need all of those different kinds of accountability um, uh, organizations, uh, institutions, um, mechanisms in order to get the, the, the rich environment. It doesn't just come about through one thing. Um, and, it's, uh, and it is, and I'm afraid will constantly be, a battle, mm -hmm. right? It's, it, it has to constantly be something that we're, we're monitoring, um, changing, and, and adapting to the way in which the environment changes and the way in which those different types of, of pressure and accountability mechanisms are functioning or not functioning. That makes a huge amount of sense. I want to go to, so, to, to Sana in a, in a second. I think the way that I understand but part of the point that you're making is that, um, and related to Gus's point, is from the end of the Second World War, when we started codifying international human rights principles that had long existed in different ways, we also, in parallel, developed an infrastructure. And I think we focus a little bit less, we focus more on the norms than on the infrastructure. So we developed human rights lawyers, we developed a curriculum for that. People could train, could aspire to become human rights solicitors. We developed legal aid in certain countries. There's a whole infrastructure, and yes, it's always a battle, and it doesn't always work, but the infrastructure's there, and then when you see a new threat, we develop a new piece of infrastructure. So my, my question to you, and looking at the UK, was, I mean, so working internationally in a number of different countries in Europe, in Africa, in Latin America, in Asia, I'm always struck by how vibrant the ecosystem in the UK is. You know, the number of think tanks, of institutes, of different government agencies looking at this issue, different facets. How do you think about this notion of the infrastructure we need? I would say to safeguard our data rights, but we know, I think, what we're talking about. As Jenny defined, you know, these are huge topics. The, prof the professionalization of data trustees, you know, algorithmic auditors, how they should be set up. I mean, so is that something that you're, you're following? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um Yes, I think, yes, and I do think that's an evolving face and it's, a, it's, it's something we're working towards and trying to, trying to address. I mean, and, and there's a, a number of different uh, things that are going on. So there is a, a, a review, for example, of the regulatory landscape across um, the whole of the UK to say, um, are these regulators still right? Is there stuff that falls in between them? Do we need a brand new regulator? Right, there's, um, there's questions about are the regulations still right and fit for purpose? And I think, um, you know, Gus, I think, you know, you paint, a, paint quite a stark picture of reality and I think it's important to see that. Um, and it hasn't gone unnoticed, right? There's, uh, you know, Cambridge Analytica and some of the, the issues around Facebook and, and, and some of these, you know, seeing the reality of what this collective data can do and how it can be used hasn't been missed. Um, but in terms of how do you address it and what do you do, um, we, government needs the help of organizations like yours and like Jenny's and academics to help us get there. And I think that 
if, if anything sets the UK apart internationally, it's the fact that we invite um, challenge and uh, experts in to, to talk to us in government. Um, and in fact, I've been told by colleagues in other countries that we potentially do that a bit more than others. So that's quite a positive thing. But I, I do think it's a moving piece, and I think it's something that we are going to be working to tackle together. Brilliant. Thank you. I want to then move, go back to the topic of data trusts, and then sort of we'll end with some questions around ownership and, and compensation, just to give you a bit of a teaser. But so on the data trust piece, um, I, I loop that one in in other questions I had earlier, but, but Gus and Jenny, do you think that it's feasible and is it a good idea to have, I'll use the term assignability, but uh, sort of assignability of data rights? I mean, Sylvia was making that distinction and the point between sort of, you know, fundamental human rights and contractual rights. In order for that to work, you need to be able to assign your data rights to a data trustee. Is that something which is potentially a good idea, we should explore it? How should we think about unintended consequences of that? What do you think? Um, so so I, I think that if you, if you um, I think you can divide uh, the rights into um, rights that protect us and rights that are, uh, which I would call ne kind of negative consent rights and um, rights that to, to have data about us used in, in other kinds of ways, so more positive rights. And data portability I would class as one of those more positive rights. You can, um, you can imagine, and indeed we encounter, places where individuals, say that are suffering from a uh, particular rare disease, want to exercise a positive right to have um, their medical records more widely shared with researchers so that they can be researched into that disease. And that's exercising a very positive right compared to a basic human right to be protected from misuse of data, which is a, which I would, I would class as, as being one of those fundamental human rights that you, that you need to have protection with. Um, so I think that where there are areas that, that assignability or, or passing on those rights to, or, or mandate, mandating is the correct legal term, okay, so mandating those rights to onto, a, uh, onto a third party, we ought to be exploring those for those more positive rights of data, of data portability, of the, the bits that I say, I definitely want this data to be shared, mm -hmm. rather than the ne more negative rights yeah. of, I need to have stuff ex explained to me, I need to be protected, if that makes sense. Um, now, whether that, I, I still get very antsy around that um, in, in general, because I think that, and especially when payment comes into it, because I think that that mutates the motivations that would, that would be associated with the sharing of, uh, of data that is fundamentally about somebody at, uh, or many people and can never be taken away from being about that person and those many people. And I still get very concerned about that. So I think that we need to tread quite carefully where we start exploring the sharing of, of data yeah. and the mandating of, of third parties to be able to control that in places where, it's, where the risks associated with it are low. Can I can I now, but can I just, but, but Gus, do you agree with that? Yeah. that, that mandate, we can mandate rights when it's for these positive rights, sharing medical data, but not others, does that make sense? I, it's not, I wouldn't use the language of mandating the rights, especially because um, a fundamental right is both positive and negative. Um, but the, the idea that you can have somebody who represents your interests, who, That's what who, who is your ambassador, who is your protector as you go forward, in that feudal sense um, that you were talking about before, I think that's um, unfortunately empowering. Ideally, you would be in control and you would have the capacity to do these things for yourself. But that's not the world that we've built, unfortunately. Right. Sylvie. I just want to, because I really liked your answer, Jenny. It was really helpful. And I, I think for me, this is really the, the next big debate. Is We haven't really, there's not much written about this for the moment. It's about, okay, so I completely agree. There are some rights that are just human rights, fundamental rights that you obviously cannot uh, transfer, assign, whatever the term is, okay. No, there are other rights, like the right to portability, that like the right to access, and like the right to erasure, potentially, which have been put in the GDPR to empower people. To, to some extent, uh, it's, a, it's a fight back against 
the fact that there are these huge data controllers that hoover data, even if we've clicked on yes at, uh, at some point online, that does not mean that we shouldn't have the power to pull that data again and perhaps use it for other purposes, etc. So the problem with these rights, I read a study published recently six months ago that said that the right to access, they studied over hundreds, hundreds of access requests and less than half of them were actually compliant with the law and very often you only got the data you should be getting with a follow-up request. Yeah. So imagine the, the time and energy that is assumed that individuals have to exercise those access rights, let alone portability rights. And so they said also very, uh, quite a large number of, of very large organizations had never received an access request, even if that was in the Netherlands, the uh, right to access had been enforced for at least 15 years. And so to me, this is a wake up call to the fact that it's lovely to grant rights, like the right to portability access, etc. But if very few people are in a position to exercise them, we, we've not made much progress. And I hope that the data trust proposal is a way of effectively empowering people to collectively exercise rights like this, but with safeguards, yeah, because collective always comes with very great dangers of misrepresentation, etc. And that's why I find that the trust law structure is helpful, because you have very robust, as robust as you can get in a legal structure, duties to act with strict uh, loyalty to the wishes and interests of the beneficiaries. So m for me, the really interesting debate now, and that's a really live question, is what rights should be made mandatable or assignable, and what rights cannot, yes? For instance, the right to vote, you're never gonna assign your right to vote. There are obvious public policy reasons why you shouldn't do that. Other rights like uh, that protect you and your dignity should never be assignable either. But uh, I would argue that the right to portability, access, and erasure are rights that are at the moment, they are crucial in order to address the power imbalance between data controllers and data subjects but very few people are in a position to exercise them. And I think that's a problem. So in the, in the few minutes that we've got left, I wanna try and draw another line in the sand and see where, where people stand. So should people ever be compensated for data, either about them or their data, which is a term that I'm, I'm less keen on. Um, I've been having a, a conversation with, with some of the authors of the, the thinking around data as labor. And their point is that if you consider, if you imagine data as labor, it's different from looking at data as ownership, but there's still a compensation mechanism, right? So people would still be compensated in different ways, in this case, for the fruits of their labor. Um, for me, I would love to get your views. The compensation sort of notion sits uneasily with me. I'd love to sort of, you know, be, be richer from your expertise in it. Sylvie, obviously, I'd love to know whether you think, because you and Neil make a, make a good point about the plurality of the different trusts. I asked an earlier question about whether some trust could be set up for ill purposes. Now, you may think, I don't know, that compensation isn't an area to go to, but people may set up a data trust to sort of get rich on, uh, around their data. So that one for that. And then I know that, Jenny, you'll have some views on the, on the compensation piece. So maybe starting with Jenny and then coming back to Sana. Jenny, compensation, well, good or bad? Uh, bad. Um, so, uh, and really, I, I follow Privacy International's phrase, which, which is um, that this that leads to, oh gosh, what, what is it? <laughs> Privacy as a um, luxury, yeah. right? Privacy as a luxury. So, so um, what, I, what I fear is that when, when we start introducing the notion of, uh, of being um, recompensed for data that is about us, then the motivation that it introduces is to is if I am desperate for some money, then I am willing to give up some of my uh, some of my rights over data that is about me in ways that would then um, come back on me, on my family, on my community. Um, and I fear the emergent property of that is that we uh, is that we have very different different kinds of data practices for people who are uh, already socially excluded um, to those who are already. Uh, have a position of power and authority. Thank you. I think we're rivaling with the local school playground, so we'll need to take <laughs> good and laugh. Don't know what the they think about. Screams. Yeah. <laughs> they the don't idea. want to be compensated for their data. <laughs> S Sana, good or bad? Compensation for your data, uh, data related to you. I'm going to take a very different uh, 
line and not answer it in, in a very politician <laughs> way. Um, but, but I am going to read out something that I think uh, is, a, is a really good way of thinking about this. So as society becomes increasingly data driven, citizens need to be confident that they can participate in and get the most out of the data economy with awareness and understanding of how it directly impacts them. So we have to provide, so it's government's responsibility to provide the clarity on the ethical questions around the use of data to ensure that the most effective use of data is fair and benefits citizens. So it doesn't directly answer your question around compensation, but I think that the key here is that we need to make sure that we are addressing the, the worries on behalf of citizens and making sure that no one's left behind and that everyone can benefit from this understanding the impact and being transparent about what we do and how we do it. So I will leave the, the actual question about compensation to the experts on the panel. Okay, so then Sylvie goes, Sylvie, what do you think? Yeah. Is that something so that would come out of the data trust perspective? So first I want to make clear the fact that um, the data trust perspective offers, it's meant to offer choice among different ways of managing the data, but that choice will be restricted by whatever regulatory framework is in place, yes? Right. So if, if, and I hope, we live in a country where we believe that, say, it is not okay for people who are unlikely to be aware of, truly aware of the risks they are taking when they say, for instance, uh, give data about the smart meters and the jogging habits and I don't know what, for compensation, financial compensation, then you can, as a regulator, say, well, guess what, there are some kinds of data that can just not be traded for financial uh, remuneration. Now, this is a choice that has to be made at government level, yeah? And that is top-down regulation that will constrain the amount of choice that people have when it comes to the data. I don't want, I'm no one to preempt that debate. So what I'm trying to say here is th that's where you need a, a dynamic between on one hand, like this bottom-up structure that says, what are the choices? What are the options here? And if the regulator has not forbidden for some data to be traded for money, then guess what? You are going to have some data trusts that are going to be set up to enable people to maximize financial gain from their data. And I hope, I really hope, there will be constraints on that. Yes, yes. I think there should be. But so from then comes a more fine-tuned question, which is, are there some kinds of data that are okay because they don't lead to some great vulnerability. Like for smart meter data, is it okay? Well, maybe it does reveal too much about your familial habits, but maybe it's not, yeah? These are fine-tuned judgments that I'm not well-placed to make, but I think it would be worthwhile distinguishing between different kinds of data and the kinds of vulnerabilities they give rise to. And I would really draw a line between, on one hand, say, jogging habits and smart meter data. It's not the same kind of vulnerability. Hmm. Okay. This is a nice segue. So. Yes. Is that different? Compensation? Good or bad? Uh, it's a, I hate to be this person, but it's a terrible idea. <laughs> if it's a fundamental right, that means it cannot be taken away from you. You add a financial and economic layer to this problem, it means that the way we've taken the fundamental right of privacy and enshrined it in data protection is that you can entrust your data with entities and you have the right to withdraw that. You can say, I want my data back. I want my data deleted. I don't trust you anymore. You shall not have it. But when you add a financial layer to this entire transaction, how does that affect your fundamental right? Can you withdraw? Or do they now own it? And then you get into the property law question that is completely, it's, it, you can't reconcile with the data protection and privacy is a fundamental right. It's just, it's two bodies of law that just don't come together, which is why you can't sell your kidney. It's, for, it's just, you can't, do you get it back when you, when you want it back, when you don't like the individual that you gave your kidney to? No, it just doesn't compute. And I think, and, and I, I tend to agree, and I think the difference, but I think the difference between the data and your kidney is that <laughs> your kidney wasn't used to train other people's kidneys, and so, the use of the, you know, my data <laughs> as training data, yeah. which never goes away. I can say, you know, I have the right to withdraw the data, but that data was used, the training data was used, it used the patterns and it impacts other people and other societies. Yeah. So I'm afraid in terms of time, this is what we've got. I love this panel. I love talking with these great people. I hope that you've loved it as much as I have. So thank you to all of you.
and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you.